Rav had said that you're able to draw from a mission of four halachos. The case, the Mishnah speaks about a person taking a basket of figs that were shviyas and he gives it to one woman to marry all five of them. And two of them are sisters. So it says the three are married and the two sisters are not married. So we're able to draw a, four halachas from this Mishnah. However, he's, Rav personally was only able to draw four, three conclusive halachas from the Mishnah. Three definitive halachas. One of them he wasn't able to. What was that? Firstly, he drew from the Mishnah that Per Shvius Hefker, that although the field belonged to them, but because it was Shvius, it was the sabbatical year, so the produce is Hefker, it's ownerless. But if it would have been during other years of the sabbatical cycle, it wouldn't be, she wouldn't be married. She would not. Took without her permission. He took the produce without their permission. So it's only because it's Shvius, it's ownerless, therefore she's married. Also, if you Makadish a woman with her stolen object, although she remains silent, she receives it, it's Edim Kudesh. Mm -hmm. Although it's Gzela Didah, it's her stolen mm -hmm. object, and she receives it. Although she didn't say anything, she's Edim Kudesh. She's not married. And the third Allah was that a woman could be an agent on behalf of the others, although they become co-wives. That, that was the third Allah, which is not the case where we left off that if a woman says, Mace Bailoch, your husband passed away, she's not believed, because she's only saying it because she wants to, the other woman to remarry, and then she'll become a, an adulteress, because she knows the husband factually is alive, therefore she can't be trusted. Because co-wives, they actually, they hate one another. Go ahead. He told her, Shavit Pruta per one. Yeah, he definitely. Shavit Pruta per, per woman. There's enough to go around for all of them. Take the basket, which we're divided among all five of you. That's what he says. It seems like they don't know exactly what they're doing. Doesn't make a difference. Divide it among all of you. I'm giving each one of you minimally a Shavit Pruta, right? So there's no question that they're getting more than they believe they're getting. So Mars says, what would have been the fourth one, which Rav did not define what the fourth halach would be? Gedushin Mishur and Labio. That if one does performs a condition and the woman is not available to him to cohabit, it's not a marriage. So Mar says, the Nechshva, so why doesn't he count that as one of the halochas that you derive from the Mishnah? Mishum des Vesapkele, because Rav himself is, is in question, Ika bai Ika Right, we had a machlok, Abai and Rav, Kedushin Mishur and Labio, Havi Bia, Lo Havi Bia. So Rav and Abai each learned the Mishnah differently to, to reconcile the Mishnah with their position. So therefore, since it was unclear to him, therefore the fourth halochi did not extrapolate from the Mishnah, because he understood Abai and Rav, each one has their own way to learn. No, but either way, so just draw that from the Mishnah. Each of them brought a, a proof from the Mishnah. Rav brought a proof from the Mishnah, Kedushim, Mishnah, and Lohavi Kedushim. Abai learned the case as a, a specific case. It's only because it was that way, but if not, Kedushim, Mishnah, and Lohavi one, something would have learned, so why does he learn that fourth halacha? The answer is because he was, it, was, it was unclear to him if we follow Ravo or Abayi's interpretation of the Mishnah. Even though the Gemara refuted Ravo, right, from a Brisa, so evidently we refuted him from a Brisa. He wasn't aware. Ravo wasn't aware of that Brisa. They're, they're, all, they're all contemporaries. So he was unaware, like Ravo was, un was unaware of the Brisa, which he was refuted from, so uh, Ravo's unaware of it. If he was aware, of course, it would have, it would have been conclusive, right? Like, like Abayi. Okay. So one of the lochas we, we derive from the Mishnah is that it's why they married, it's only because the produce of Shvius is ownerless. He took their produce, but because it wasn't theirs, because it was Shvius, but it would have been during any of the other years of the sabbatical year, although you're giving her, you're returning it to her, for Kedushin, and she remained silent, and Mukudeshis. Kisolak Reb Zero, so what are you saying? Makadish Begezel, and Mukudeshis. If you marry a woman with something which is stolen, right, it's not, it's not a valid marriage. Kisolak Reb Zero, now the Gemara tells us in Brochos, which we studied many years ago. David had the uh, good fortune to study it here. We even studied it more than once, many, many years ago. The Gemara says Reb Zero originally was a Babaloi, he was a Babylonian. And he wanted to ascend to Eretz Israel, 
and his Rebbe was opposed to it. Because his Rebbe interpreted a Pesach saying, you're only going to return when the base will be rebuilt. That was, so he went, he went regardless, but he went, he didn't in any way do anything disrespectful, and he went, so he, he fasted 100 fasts before he left Boville to go to Eretz because the methodology of learning and the approach in Boville was different than Eretz So he fasted 100 fasts that he should forget, not the, the rulings, but the approach, because he has to be open-minded to be able to um, to be able to acclimate himself, to be open to the new approach of how to understand something. So Kisolik Rebzeira, when Rebzeira ascended, meaning he went from Bavl to Eretzro, who was in Eretzro? Tam Reb Yochanan. Reb Yochanan was the leading Torah sage. He was the, the God Lador at the time in Eretzro. He stayed, he remained there. Omr lo lo shmaitz akam to Reb Yochanan. He quoted Rav's position to Reb Yochanan. That what? The only reason why she's Mukudeshes is why is because it was Perishvias, which are Hefker. But if it would have been during any of the other years, it's about a cycle, although he's giving to her any Mukudeshes. Omra Leg, Loshmait Sukami to Rabbi Yochan, Omra Leg, Mi Omra Rapochi. So Rabbi Yochan was taken aback. Did Rav really say this? So the Gemara asks, what, what, what was Rab, the Gemara misunderstood what Rabbi Yochan had said? It seems to be Rabbi Yochan was, was taken aback that Rav should say such a thing. That during the other years of the sabbatical cycle, she would not be married. So Mar says, Bulu Omar. You mean, and he doesn't concur with this? Rav Yochan himself concurs with exactly what Rav said, that it's Enbu Kodeshes. Vomar Rav Yochanan, Gezel Vlusi Yashu Abayim, a person has a stolen object, and the original owner who was stolen from did not despair. Shneim Ein Michol Lahagdish. Both the thief and the original owner cannot consecrate it. The thief cannot consecrate it. Why? Because it's not his. And the owner, of course, it's not a, under his jurisdiction. Why? Because the Gemara quotes a posuk. The Gemara quotes a posuk in, in Bavakamo. It says, Ish ki yagdish es beso kodesh lashem. Hear the posuk. Ernie, I want you to get the source. Ish ki yagdish es beso kodesh lashem. Ma beso shelo. Of Koshalo. You want to consecrate something, it has to be yours. So that's why the thief cannot consecrate it. And why the owner not? Ma beso brushuso, that your house is in your domain, of Kosha brushuso. The object that you consecrate has to be in your domain. So since we hold Karke and Exelis, if you steal property, fixed property, it's still in the domain of the original person because you're only dispossessing the owner from what's rightfully his. So it's still Bershuso. So somebody steals a piece of property from you and you want to consecrate it, although he removed you from the property, it's a valid consecration. Because that's still Bershuso. But if it will be metaltlin, if it will be movables, and somebody stole an object from you, once it's taken out of your domain, you no longer have control over it, you can... It doesn't make a difference, but you have no control. You have no control, you cannot consecrate it. So once discussed, there's a, there's a question, what exactly is the issue of Eidu Bishuso. If somebody steals somebody, something from someone, why could, he cannot, why could he not consecrate it? Is it because physically it's not under his jurisdiction? He has no control? And to consecrate something, you have to have control of it. So what would the halakhic difference be? Let's say you lose something. It's not stolen. You lose something in the street, and you have no idea where it is. You say, wherever it may be, it should be consecrated. Is it a valid consecration? Mm -hmm. If, in fact, it means it has to be under your control, under your jurisdiction, or accessible to you, so it's not accessible. You have no idea where it is. It's lost. So then, it's not. Or maybe it means something else. It means, which we discussed many times, what's the aloha if a person steals something, and then he alters the stolen item right. after, after the alteration? Why is it his? So the Gemara says, it says, you must return the stolen item that you stole. But it has to be It has to be in the same state as you stole it. But if you make the alteration, it's not the thief is Kona. The thief acquires it. Now the mm -hmm. question is, what's the Kenyan? When we speak of the thief, alters it. It's not he does not do the physical alteration. Let's say 
Lightning strikes it, and it shatters it, and it's in public domain. The thief acquires it, but he didn't make the alteration. And it, they, so how does he acquire it? What? But what? How does it? How? But what's what's the? But what's the mechanism? How, how does it go into his domain? So the way it's explained, the way it's explained is a famous word from the Sivs and Mishpat. When a person steals something, he has full liability. He's chay ba'onsin. Now, why is he chay ba'onsin? Why does he have full liability? Wait one second. Wait a second. I'm telling you what the Sivs. Okay? You're saying what, what we once said in the Sivs, except in Sivs says it a little bit better. Okay, okay. So let, let's understand it. Because you, you're going through the back door, I'm going through the front door. Okay. Okay. So the Nesiva says this. When a person, let's say, is a show ale, a person is a borrower. Now we know that different custodians have different levels of liability. A show machinim has the least degree of liability. A show masochar, a paid custodian, has a greater degree of liability. A show ale, a borrower, has full liability. Why does he have full liability? Mm -hmm. So the Torah says it, it's logical. Of course, we say kol hano shelo. The Torah says since you have all the benefit without any cause factor, so therefore if something should happen to it just as the owner. You have all the rights of an owner. Over there, legally, you have the rights of the man. lent it to you. So just as the owner, if something would happen to his object, something beyond his ability, he's not faulted whatsoever, he takes the full loss. So the borrower who has all the rights of an owner without paying for it, he also has to, he has to take full liability. The Torah gives him full liability for that reason. That is a show ale. What about a thief? A thief has full liability. Now, why does he have full liability? So the Nesib Samishpat explains, because the Torah gives him, to become a thief, you have to do an act of acquisition. Normally, when you do an act of acquisition, the owner transfers the rights to the acquirer, to whoever purchases it, whoever acquires it. But over here, who's... The, the, the victim is not transferring anything. The Torah gives you rights in the object. Why does the Torah give you those ownership rights? That if anything should happen to it, you have full liability. That's why the Torah gives you rights. So therefore now, so you have r the rights of an owner because you have to have full liability. But so, so why don't you own it? Of course, the Torah says you must return it. But once you alter it, and you, it's no longer the same object, object. You ha one doesn't have the obligation to return it. So now those ownership rights cause that it should become yours fully. Understand? The Gemara says like this. The Gemara says above a comma that if a person's ox gores somebody else's ox, okay, and kills the ox. So the carcass, so what is the owner of the ox who gored the other ox? What's his level of, of liability as a damager? Right? The difference between the carcass and the living uh, and the living ox, when it was alive, it was worth a thousand dollars. Now, as a carcass, it's worth two hundred dollars. So he owes him eight hundred dollars. What happens till they discover what happened? The meat deteriorates and it it's worth fifty dollars. What does the damager, the owner of the ox who was who killed the other ox, what does he have to pay? He only has to pay eight hundred dollars. Why? Because factually, what was the damage? The damage was an $800 damage loss. Now that the meat deteriorates, whose, whose carcass was it? It was the carcass of the damagee. But the Gemara says, what happens if he would steal the ox? Not his ox didn't kill the other ox. He stole it, and now the ox dies. And by the time he returns the ox to the owner, and he wants to use the carcass as payment. He goes, shove a You could pay as long as it's, it's, it has value, you can pay it as towards the, towards the debt. And by the time he f finds out that it died, it's, ba it's barely, barely worth anything. Right? What does he have to pay him? He has to pay him the full, val the full value. Because the, mo because the moment the ox is no longer the ox you stole, you have full liability. Either you return the ox or you return its value. So if the ox exists, so you return the ox. Now the ox is no longer alive. You have to return its value, its restitution. Right? You have to pay its full value. So you say, well, when it died, it was worth $200. It's relevant. Your obligation is restitution. So if you could return the ox intact as you stole it, so there's no obligation restitution because you're returning the ox. But if the ox is no longer here, now you have full liability. You want to use the remains of the ox towards restitution. So let's see what its value is. If it's whatever its value is, 
to that degree, that's it will contribute to the restitution of the ox that you stole. Okay? One second. A borrower, a borrower has full liability. No, no, no. A borrower, no, no. A borrower would be the, what's his name? No, no. A borrower would not be like a thief in regard to that. Because he doesn't have the kinyonim. He has full liability as an owner. But let's say the shards. Let's say it was a vessel and the vessel breaks. Who owns the shards? The owner owns the shards. A thief, the thief owns the shards. Does, does not own the shards. Right. So can I just explain the inner square? Like, like he acquires an interest in Kenya Kenyan. He had a Kenyan like an owner, like an owner initially. Initially, initially when he stole it, Torah gave him that, that, uh, that level of ownership. And now when by the transfer, he transferred full ownership. So the only thing that prevented him from take being the full owner because he had an obligation to return it. But now that it's no longer in its original state, so now we take, he owns, the, he owns what, what remains. Okay. So that's the under, that's what's any bushuso. So if a person steals something, why can't he consecrate it? The owner, because the thief now has removed it from your domain. Not only in the physical sense, you're not the, you're not you're no longer the full owner. So because you're no longer the full owner, therefore until you regain full possession, you can't consecrate it. You still own it, but the other person has a significant interest in that. And that interest, could you consecrate something where you have a partner? You can't consecrate it, right? You can only consecrate what's yours. But here, every aspect of what you have, he owns. Therefore, the Torah says, unless you're, you have that full ownership, you can't consecrate it, okay? You can. You can. You can. You can. So I, I, I alluded to it when I was answering it because there you owned 100% of your 50%. Here in every aspect of what you have, he has an interest. So by you consecrating it, you're affecting his interest. In the, see, there it's 50-50. Okay, to be determined. But here it's, it's 100% of every aspect of it. You understand? Here's no, see, by Vic, they talk about Breyer. Because we're, we're partners. Here the Torah gives you an interest in every aspect of what the owner has to give you liability in if s something should happen to it. Yes, you did. You did. You did. There's a whole question. There's a whole question. Yeah, there's a whole question. No, no, because... Who doesn't want, the partner doesn't want, doesn't want it. See, uh, it's a whole discussion whether yes or not. Because over there it's to the detriment of someone else. But over here, over here, it's, you don't have to because it's to the detriment. Because factually, you here the thief has something in every aspect of what you have. There it's, it's like, like you said, Brayer, it's 50-50. Here it's not 50-50. Here it's... it's correct, correct. But even if he despairs, we'll say he can't, because he still has an obligation to return it. Unless he waives the obligation to return it. Even despair. Even despair. Oh, the only person who can benefit from despair is the third party. The thief himself, the Torah does not allow, because your obligation to return it preceded the despair of the one who was, who was the victim. The owner. When? No, no, he does not have full ownership. Doesn't the Torah says you can you, you st as long as you have an obligation to return it, you cannot have full ownership. It's only once it's altered you get full ownership, because it's not considered the original object. Is that animal that it's not the same object. It's not. It's not a living animal any longer. So now, now you have full ownership. Yes. Yes. The thief has full ownership. Correct. 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 So therefore, let's say it decomposes now. Who takes the loss? The thief takes the loss. Okay. So there's, there's a famous argument between the Balamor and the Ramban that if the thief alerts the victim that he has it and he wants to return it and he welcomes him to come to take it, with that alone, so now 
the object, the thief informs the victim, the one he stole from, the owner, that he has the object and he's, well, he's willing to return it. He just has to come to take possession. So there's an argument. So the, see, some learn that what's the machlokas? So one says mm -hmm. at that point, if he wants to consecrate it, the owner, he can consecrate it before he picks it up. The other one says no. So how did they learn? What's the argument? The, arg the way they learn, the argument is this. If you say, what's considered a brushuso? That what determines whether something is your, is, 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 uh, could be affected has to be under your jurisdiction. So the moment it gives you permission, that's considered under your, your jurisdiction. It's no different than a shomer. If I give something to a custodian to watch for me, and I want to consecrate it when it's in the possession of the shomer, I could consecrate it. Of course, the object is always accessible to the owner. So if the thief over here says you're welcome to, to retrieve it, so now it's accessible to the owner, therefore he can consecrate it. That's one position. The other one says, no, he can't come. Until he takes physical possession and retrieves it, he cannot consecrate it. So they want to say, what's the machlokas? The machlokas is, what exactly is the basis for not being considered in your domain? Is it accessibility or it's the kinyonic zelo? Or it's because the person has an inherent interest as a result of stealing. What we call Kenyan Exhale, he has a financial interest. And that financial I interest is only uh, returned only when he takes physical possession. Okay? But they cite Yerushalmi. They cite Yerushalmi. Yerushalmi says that if you, uh, if you consecrate a lost object, it is a valid consecration. So you see clearly from Yerushalmi that, that it does not be accessible to you. It does not be under your jurisdiction. So evidently, what determines whether you have can you, what determines whether it is in your possession or not? It's not under your jurisdiction. Rather, somebody, the thief has a uh, financial interest in the object, which which infringes on the rights of the owner. That's the reason. So, what's the argument? What does it take to release those those rights of the thief? Th that, that intrinsic right. Does he have to physically return it, or does what, what uh, making it available to the owner to to to, to re recover it? That's sufficient for him to release his interest in the object. That's, that's the way they learned the Machlokas, the Ramban, and the Balamor. Well, that, 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 that's a consequence of this argument. No, 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 no. He's still a thief. He still has Kinyonic Zelo. No, according to the other one, if he says he's no longer a thief and he could count them, then he's a showman. And he's a shown, but according to the opposite, he's still a thief. So if it's struck by lightning, he has the full liability. Because he's still. Shomachinam. That was a Shomachinam. Okay? That's to fulfill your obligation. Yeah, yeah. It's true, but the question is, is that enough for him to, re to, re to relinquish? We're talking about where the owner agreed. No, he agreed. The owner agreed. He's coming to take it. Right, and he agreed to it. And he says, I don't agree. No, then that for definitely not. <coughs> it's where he agreed to take it. Okay? So more asks, how could Rabbi Yochan, when he heard Rab's ruling, that if he's Makarish Bukzelo, she's Eni Bukudeshis, with a stolen up, she's not married, so... Rav Yochan was taken aback. He says, how could Rav Yochan be taken aback? Rav Yochan himself actually concurs with this. He says, Gezel, If something stolen, the owner did not despair. Both the owner and the thief can't consecrate it. So the Mora goes and says, Rav Yochan, and what he, what he was amazed, wasn't at the ruling, but just to the contrary. You mean Rob concurs with me? Just the opposite. Rob concurs with me? He was impressed. No, he already said this concept. See, here's Rabbi Yochanan. See, Rob, Rob's statement concurs, is consistent with what his position is. I mean, Tosin didn't ask a question over there. I mean, what is even the consideration? What is the consideration a person steals something that he should be able to consecrate it? What's the chidush? Same thing. Rabbi Yochanan says, Rabbi Yochanan says, If a 
person, we learn from there that the thief cannot consecrate it and the owner can't consecrate it. The thief can't consecrate because it's not his. Tos says, what's the chidush? It's understood. Mm -hmm. You can only consecrate something's yours. Tos says, a dochik. Tos says something difficult. He says, the chidush is not on the thief's side of it, it's of the owner. You would think, since factually it's his object, he should be able to consecrate it. To reveal, no, that either because it's not under his jurisdiction or because the thief, mm -hmm. the Torah gives the thief certain inherent rights in the object, that infringes on the rights of the owner, therefore he can no longer consecrate it. That's what the Torah is revealing from the, regarding this pasuk. Just as the, the house is not only yours, but it's, it's fully under your jurisdiction, the item you consecrate has to be fully under your jurisdiction. But in terms of the thief not being able to consecrate, that's a double portion. That's understood. Because you can only consecrate something that's yours, as you can only transfer something that's yours. Okay, we'll discuss it. But you know, it's interesting. It says, Gozal or Gezel of Yashua Bailin. If somebody, you have a stolen object and the owner did not despair, it says both of them cannot be Magdashit. But let's say, let's say the owner did despair. This is very important. If the owner did despair, mm. right, there was a Yush, then it seems to be it's valid consecration. It's valid. Why is it valid? But factually, when he's consecrated, we just said that the thief himself, no, cannot benefit from the despair. You need what we call Yush or Shin Yushus. If he gives it to a third party, the third party could acquire it. But in terms of himself, he has an obligation to return it, correct? So a little, a little difficult over here. If the case where he stole the basket of fruits from the women and it wasn't shvius, it seems to be, what's the reason why they're not married? Because the, the women did not despair. But if they would have despaired, they'd be married. No, 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 that's the difficulty. But if we're saying the thief cannot benefit from the despair, so the women may be being acquiring, they're acquiring it, but factually, he didn't give them something which was his. Even if they despaired. Even if they despaired. Right? right? Until, somebody Until somebody takes possession, nobody owns it. Yeah. They own it. They own it. They own it. They own it. Well, we'll discuss a bit who owns it. We'll discuss who owns it. No, no. Let's say it's Hefker. Let's say it's Hefker. This is Machlux Rishon. Most Rishonim Ho are the opinion that it's theirs until somebody takes possession. The spare only gives somebody a right to take possession. Let's say somebody loses an, a, a lost article and he's meyayish and he spares. And before someone takes possession, the one who lost the article notices it. And he's no longer in a state of despair. Does he have to reacquire it or not? The difference is if somebody now goes and preempts him and takes it. If you say it's half care, then the person lost his article because he, he has to repossess it. But if you say it's, it remains his until somebody takes possession of it, then the moment he's no longer in a state of despair, the third party can't take it any longer. I mean, it's a halakha difference. Most Rishonim say that it's not hefker. It's not hefker. It's only whoever finds it's permitted to take it. Rashi sheet is, it's hefker. That it's considered the moment person's space becomes ownerless. So therefore, if a third party finds it, even if the owner says, I, he screams, I don't want you to take it's mine, it's not his any longer. But the owner, but the thief, but if it was stolen, the same thing. Is it a hefker? And the thief, it, no, no, the thief cannot acquire it because he has an obligation to return it. Because that was the original object. Or do we say no? You have to return it because you can't benefit, it's still theirs. Until a third party takes possession, they have a right to take possession. Okay? So that's mm -hmm. the question here. When you marry a woman, we discussed this in the past, do you have to give her something of yours? We had a case, a woman is a choloshish posakona. A woman is deathly ill. And you take orlo kloya kerem that you're not permitted to benefit from, right? The, the yield of the first three years. Or kloya kerem where you planted a vineyard, a wheat field near a vineyard. And you take the produce, which you're not permitted to benefit, and you give it to the woman for kedushin. Arem ugudeshesli with this orlo. She's permitted to eat it. So to her, it has value. But what he, he's not giving her anything. In terms of his, his ownership, he has no ownership in it. 
So we mentioned Ritva earlier, the first parak. Ritva says she's Mukadeshis. Why is she Mukadeshis? Because factually, it was through him she received something of value. That's sufficient. He doesn't have. No, 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 no. Not like Hanno. Not Hanno. Not, that's, no, but the service is yours. A person is a comedian who dances before a woman. The entertainment you provide, that's your entertainment. But here, the Orlo is not your Orlo. You're giving her a thousand miles worth of fruit. Yeah, but you're not marrying her with the service. You're marrying her with the fruit. With the fruit, you're marrying her here. The fruit is worth a dollar. The service is worth a pruta. I'm marrying you with the fruit. But he's not giving her a dollar because it's not his dollar. But yet, Ritva says she's Mukadeshis. To her, there is a. To her age. But for a person's Cholashish Vasakona, the Torah says they're permitted. They could even. And she's allowed to pay for it. So therefore, she could take monetary. She could has monetary ownership on it. No. That's something else to receive of the money. No. No. He's benefiting. He's benefiting from, that's considered benefiting from something Sando. So mar no, marriage is not that. It's Mitzvah Slav Lehenis. It's not a monetary only, a, a gain. When you marry a woman, it's not a monetary gain. It's not now you have a housekeeper and a cook and, a, and everything else. It's not that. No, no, it's not your asset. It's not your asset. It's that, that's it. That's the question. That's the question. Do you have to relinquish your object, your asset? and she acquires it, or I have to facilitate something of value to the recipient. I have to bring that about, even though I relinquish nothing of my own. No, not that. No, that's, then it's, uh, Israel is irrelevant. Everybody would agree it works. I'm telling you, but the Ritva explains, because that's our case here. The thief does not own the object, because the thief cannot benefit the Torah doesn't allow him to take possession of the object because he has an obligation to return it. But she, being the third party, she could take possession. Now, how did she take possession of the object? Because he facilitated it to her. It was because he agreed to relinquish it, to give it to her. So why does she own the full value of whatever she receives? Because he gave it to her. But he didn't give us something which was his. Right? So that's, this would be similar to the Yisra No, Right? But yet it says over here clearly she's Mukadeshis. It's only because over here it says, Gezu Velonis Yashua Bailam. In our case, it's because they didn't despair. But the inference is if they would have despaired and he would marry them with the fruit, they would be married. The thief, they would marry to the thief. It's only because it was Hefker. What's the negative? It says over here, the only reason is because Velonis Yashua. That's what it says. Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan was saying, Rabbi Yochanan and Rav, they both say the same thing. And what did Rav, what did Rabbi Yochanan say? Gezel v'lo nisyayshu abaylam. But if they would have, they would have been Yush, they'd be married. Even during the first six years, not the sabbatical year. But factually, he didn't give her anything of value. He didn't relinquish anything of value of his. So the Rishonim say, you see clearly from the Gemara, you don't have to rel you relinquish something of value which is to you value, as long as she receives something of value due to your giving it to her. That's a machlokus. That's the machlokus of Ayin Rava. Right? Yovid mahani, yovid lo mahani. Torah tells you not to do something. Could you, your act, when you defy the Torah, does your action have any value? Return the object. Return the object. Okay. Put it this way. It's, it's, a gemar, it's a Gemara in Tamoriv. It's about two pages of Gemara. The gemar, there's an argument between Ayin Rava and this concept. And one takes one position, the other, and says, but I have multiple proofs that you're wrong. And the other one says, I have multiple proofs, you're wrong. Each one answers, that's the exception. And these, this is one of the exceptions. It, it cites verses, psukim, to show that this is the exception. According to the one that says, Ovid, Mahani, even if you defy the Torah, it's effective. So it's not the, the, the posuk, that's the, that's the rule, that's not the exception to the rule. The other one says, no, that's the exception to the rule. I'll t give you an example. The Gemara says a, a, a Kohen is not permitted to marry a Grusha, a divorcee. But yet if he marries her, the Torah says he's married. Says, that's the exception to the rule. 
You understand? It goes through about 10 cases. Each one is, the Torah says, you, you're not permitted to, to make Tamura. To take a consecrated animal says, this isn't the place of that. But Yenis says, who Tamura say Yakodesh? When you do, it is effective. They're both consecrated, but you're not permitted. That's the exception to the rule. The other one says, no, that is the rule. It's just to the contrary. You understand? No, no, you, the person is obligated to provide it. To provide correct, it. correct. So now I understand that. Okay, that's not a good example. No, but I'm just bringing a proof. No. The Gemara, the inference the Gemara says, the only reason why she's not married because there was no Yush. Because the owner did not despair. You, you're asking on that. But factually, the Gemara says, but if she did despair, she would be married. You're asking a side question. But Torah says you must return it. But factually, same question. But he didn't give her anything. He didn't give them something which belonged to him. So there, that would be the parallel case to the Kaloya Karen. That he didn't give her anything that belongs to him either. It wasn't his, although she could benefit from it. And it could be considered her asset. Right? So I'm just saying. So I'm just saying. Th that's the whole discussion of Abayin Rova. When Torah says not to do something and you defy the Torah, is your action effective or is not effective? No, no. E everybody agrees it's effective. Everybody agrees it's effective. It's because it's all based on psukim. The question is, is the pasuk, as I explained, the rule or the exception to the rule? The Gemara says in Baba Kama, Yish Vashini Rishus, in every case, the owner despairs and the thief goes and sells it to a third party. The third party is considered the rightful owner now. But there it's not within the conte context of Kedushin. You'd say the truth is the thief didn't transfer it. it, the pers it independently, he took possession. But here, he was calling, he's the Makadish, he's the husband. There, there is a consequence over here. Right? So that's what we have to discuss the Gemara in Tamura. When you defy the Torah, is your, is your action effective or is it not effective? Okay? Maysve. Kicha begezel. A person marries a woman with a stolen object. Bechomos. What's chomos? Chomos is a person forces somebody, forces a person to sell something. He pays its market value. Ubegnevo. Something which was stolen. Gezel is open, mean armed robbery. And gnevo. Gnevo is something which the person is unaware that he, it was even stolen from him. O shechotav selim yoda vikicha. He grabbed a coin from her. Grip, took it out of the hand against her will, and they gave it back to her. Mukudeshes. So here we see that although he, it was her object initially, but if he gives it back to her in the, in the context of Kedushim, Kedushim, we should remain silent. And here, the, one of the laws we drew from our mission, extrapolated from the mission, was that if, you, if it wouldn't have been the sabbatical year, and you would take the fruit and give it back to the woman, although it was her fruit, it's any Mukudeshes. Was saying the only reason why she was married because the fruits are ownerless. But if the fruits would have been theirs it would have been during any of the other years of the sabbatical cycle, she would not be married. Here we find a Bryce contrary to this. It, although he s took the coin out of her hand and gave it back to her for Kedushin, Mugodeshis, Samar says, Hosum Migazlido. Was speaking about, he stole it from her. Habik Tony said, Vishot of Self Bishelo, right? It says he st he took the coin from her, mechal the reisha begal yesel dalma askinon. So it seems to be even if you stole from from a third party, perushi kama farish. The the conclusion of the of the brisa is is elucidating the opening statement. Kitcha begezel bechamisu begneivo keitzat. What is an example of that? Go shechot avselaf miyoda vikitcha bo. She's mukodeshes. But now we have our problem. We have a contradiction, because we inferred from our mishnah. That why is she married in our Mishnah, where he takes her fruit only because the fruit is ownerless. But if the fruit would have been hers, although you gave it back to her in Kedushin, and she remained silent, she's animal Kodesh, so that's the most question. Our Mishnah, we're speaking where it was stolen from her. And Rab says, we draw from the Mishnah, 
So how do you reconcile the b'risa with our Mishnah? To be continued.